Pete Buttigieg is the 37-year-old mayor of South Bend, Indiana. He is now number three in the polls in early states of Iowa and New Hampshire. He has made his presidential bid official. He did that on Sunday. Watch this. It is time to walk away from the politics of the past and towards something totally different. My name is Pete Buttigieg. They call me Mayor Pete. I'm a proud son of South Bend, Indiana, and I am running for president of the United States. Joining us now is the Democratic presidential candidate, Pete Buttigieg, the mayor of South Bend. It is nice to have you here in person. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me in. So other than making us feel like we haven't accomplished <laughs> enough in our lives, I'm 37 next week. All right. Um, 37 you're, you're years old. Poppy. We've been saying clearly. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you. High in the polls. You've raised millions of, of dollars. And six weeks ago, most of America could not pronounce your name, myself included. I will admit that and send you the clip. How did this happen? Well, uh, you know, the turning point for us was the CNN town hall. But uh, the thing that's most encouraging to me is what I had to say that night wasn't that different from what I've been saying all along. So the lesson we drew from it is when people hear our message, when they hear what I have to say about generational change mm -hmm. and building a generational alliance to move our country in the future, when they hear the new vocabulary I'm trying to put together about a progressive vision on freedom, democracy, and security, it lands, it resonates, and, and people respond very powerfully to it. So, you know, obviously this is what we were hoping would happen, but it's, but I have think, to admit. Can, we, can you just be honest, did you think it would? Not this quickly. Right. Uh, you know, we, we were kind of patiently building an organization, and suddenly it, it popped. And, you know, you only get to uh, kind of arrive on the scene once, and so we've got to make the most, and we have, I think, made the most of that moment to build something lasting. Uh, you know, you want to make sure you're not regarded as, as just a flash in the That's pan. True. But I think the fact that we've been at this for more than a month, so we've literally outlived the flavor of the month period, now comes the sometimes unglamorous work of building out those early state organizations, uh, doing the fundraising, doing the grassroots volunteer organizing that'll power us all the way through into next year. Well, you certainly seem to have inspired a, a, a grassroots uh, uh, mobiliz mobilization moment. And there is a generational change message that's resonating. But now also comes the time where people press you on specifics. Yeah. Um, and you've spoken about how values should inform philosophy, and that goes down to uh, policy. But when you say, for example, there'll be a radical change under a, a Buttigieg presidency, what does that mean? Because a lot of people, I think, have caught into your message because it feels reassuringly moderate in some oh, respects. Interesting. Well, uh, first of all, uh, tone it really matters, right? So even as we're contemplating serious and sometimes profound structural reforms, uh, we can do it in a way that doesn't make everyone feel like our hair is on fire. Look, mm. this moment should not be underestimated in terms of its seriousness. I think in many ways we're still underreacting. Uh, but we don't have to react to it in a way that alienates others, in, in a way that uh, makes it feel like there's such screaming that you can't tell what's even going on around that us. That makes you a clear contrast to the president. Yeah. And I'm interested, Mayor, if you make it all the way, how would you run against him? Would you ignore? Would you give him a nickname? He'll, g <laughs> he'll give you one. Yeah, I, I mean, really, how do you use that? Temp your temperament really versus his. Yeah, it's such an important question. I, th I think the, the way we have to approach it is, on one hand, when he says something that isn't true, we have to say so. When he does something wrong, we got to call it out. But then we got to move on very quickly because a, a really robust message for my party can't be one that revolves around the personality of somebody from the other party. we got to have a message that will make as much sense in 2040 as it does in 2020. And that means it's not so much about him as it's about you. Do you think Hillary us. Clinton did that too much? Uh, you know, I think part of it was the media environment. Uh, there are also elements of our strategy, our party strategy in 2016, that now, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, I think we should adjust going into 2020. A lot of it was, it, I think a lot of Democrats were so horrified by who the Republicans were nominating that we almost forgot that saying don't vote for the other guy because he's terrible, uh -huh. even if it's convincing, is not the same you're, thing as having a message. I'm just interested. You're purposefully not using his name. You didn't do it on Sunday. Yeah. Are we going to continue to see that? I mean, his name will probably escape my lips every now and then. But uh, the, the core of this idea is it's not about him. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I think mm -hmm. a, a, somebody like him should not have been able to get close. Uh, and I think a lot of Republicans would say the same thing. The conditions that made this presidency possible are a lot bigger than one man. They are a sense of deep disruption in our economy, our society, our politics. And I think part of it is a symptom of the way in which our political system can no longer deliver results mm. that Americans believe in. Even things we think of as divisive, like immigration, which is divisive. But most Americans actually agree 
on the outlines of a bipartisan comprehensive immigration reform. There's so many issues like that where there's a rough sense among the American people about what to do, and uh, the American political system can't deliver. That leads to crazy outcomes. So w would you back, for example, the, the bipartisan uh, immigration reform that passed from the Senate that Lindsey Graham championed during the Obama years? Is that the kind of a model the of eight. you would back? Yeah, the yeah I, th I think it's the right template. I think now we know that there needs to be more by way of protections for dreamers in that policy mm -hmm. package. But the basic framework that, that we have a pathway to citizenship, that we uh, improve our lawful immigration pathways, like the one that my father came through in the 1970s as an immigrant to become an American, and to make sure that we do what we have to do on border security. That package, the outlines of it are there. The outlines there. And to the, th the fact that the Senate passed it only for it to die in the House is incredibly frustrating. And, and you know, as mayor of a, of a city in the upper Midwest, that's the crucial the battleground. Midwest. The, the great Midwest. Yeah. I say this as a Minnesota. That's right. That's right. I'm, I'm outnumbered here, although I got a lot of affection <laughs> for the Midwest. Um, you mentioned, you know, the, the Democrat strategy not working out in 2016. And I wonder from a macro standpoint, do you believe it's because Hillary Clinton and the Democrats were perceived as being too far left or not far, not, not far left enough? Hmm. You know, when you think of how many people narrowed down their choices to either Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders in the end, what it tells me is that voters are less ideological than you would think. I know this just from the math in St. Joe County where I live. There must be a lot of people who voted for Barack Obama and Donald Trump mm -hmm. and Mike Pence and me, which tells you that a lot of voters, yeah. some voters think ideologically, but some don't. I think the bigger issue was insider versus outsider. Yeah. And we looked like we were the defenders of a system. Mm. And he looked like he was promising to blow up the system. We'll talk more about that and, and get into your faith a bit in, in the next segment, because we saw President Obama uh, get 26 percent of the white evangelical vote mm. in 2008. But but on policy, um, you know, you have a history also working at McKinsey, arguably the best consulting firm out there. And you said recently it's important to pay attention to the potential that business has to propel prosperity. And I'm interested in if you think your fellow Democrats and some of your Democratic contenders and competitors in this race for the White House have vilified big business in a way that is dangerous and capitalism, when now we know more Democrats view socialism favorably than capitalism. Well, I think the reason we're having this argument over socialism and capitalism is that capitalism has led a lot of people down. I guess what I'm out there to say is that it doesn't have to be so. I believe in democratic capitalism, but the democratic part is extremely important. We, I think uh, during this Cold War, there was this assumption that capitalism and democracy were almost the same thing, that if you were for capitalism, you're also for democracy. Right now, we actually see democracy and capitalism coming into tension. Mm. It was very alarming to hear uh, recently that uh, one of the president's economic advisors said that between capitalism and democracy, he would choose capitalism. I would say the reverse ought to be true, that at the end of the day, we prioritize democracy. And you know, having that framework of uh, a rule of law, of fairness, is actually what it takes for markets can I, to work. Can I just follow up on that and just ask what that would look like? Because I see it reporting across the Midwest a lot, okay? Yep. And I see the disparity and I see what happened in my home state of Minnesota or Ohio or Pennsylvania. And they don't, they know that this capitalism isn't working mm -hmm. for them. I'm really right. interested in specifics on how you would propose fixing it. Do you support Elizabeth Warren, for example, who just proposed last week putting an additional tax on the most profitable business businesses in this country. Is that the way to help most Americans? Well, or is it I'm, a Band-Aid? I'm open to that. I think the, the more interesting issue is, should our policies be any different toward the biggest companies than they are toward the smallest ones? A, a lot of the issues with big business right now aren't from the business part of big business. They're from the big part. <laughs> uh, bigness can lead to concentrations of wealth turning into concentrations of power. And I would say the problem with money in our politics today is that people are able to use wealth to buy power and then in turn use that uh, to so you'd break them change up? the rules. You'd break them up? Sometimes if there's anti-competitive behavior, uh, then that's why we have anti-monopoly law in this country to make sure that things don't get, but it's not just about saying if you get this big, we're gonna break you. Right. It's also uh, perhaps saying that the bigger you are, the more responsibility oh, you have. What if your responsibilities around Anything from uh, reporting on, on gender pay disparity in your organization, which I think most of us agree is more of a fair thing to do for a large organization than for a small one, to potentially even wages and labor standards. We're, we're graduated at a progressive level where the bigger you are, the more we expect you to be among the very best in how you treat your workers and how you treat the communities where you operate.